So, over to you to ask questions, interact. Uh, Keith, well, you can see the names up here. Keith, Jennifer, <laughs> Horig, Gillian, and Betsy. So, if I can ask you, if you do have a question, could I invite you to stand um, and to project so that we can all hear the question? I will do my best to uh, repeat the question. And um, so, therefore, I would ask you to help me out by kind of like keeping the question as succinct as you possibly can. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe repeat it at the end so I can actually get what the gist of the question is. So, any questions, folks? To anybody? Yes, please, John. So the question is, what are some of the key things that, that have helped leaders um, make the transition? Um, that's a great question, as they always say, you know. Um, another of um, Gillian's mindfulness techniques is for when you're uh, responding to questions is always to say that's a great question so that you give yourself a little, you know, there's at least three <laughs> seconds, three seconds of space. And the three things I want to say are... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, so that... I think it's... I mean, let me, let me put this really bluntly. I think it's really hard to productize and monetize what you can do to support people in the complex space. Or to IP protect or to, it. Or to IP protect mm -hmm. it, you know. Um, and so, as a, as a consequence, I think it's really hard to try and produce products or to, 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 to do it in a way that goes beyond people interacting with other people and, and bringing their best skills into the moment in a kind of applied mindfulness, listening, exploring complexity, experimenting. All of that is people intensive and it takes the development of people to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, what we have tended to see, and I've been you know, um, taken in personally by, by, by tools where we've come up with things We've, which have been kind of in the complicated space, and then we've turned them into processes and procedures which are in the simple space, many of which are really kind of useful. I mean, it's really useful in time management and other things like that, although even then, time, my, my time management, I suspect, suspect, is an adaptive challenge and not a technical problem. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so I, I think, that if you like, the system of trying to make a living and making it work, and trying to make it work then, because everyone would like a piece of that, please, pulls us into the simple and the complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll also add, you know, for us, one of the things that we've found is the wisdom that comes by working and teaching uh, in a team environment. So in our leadership system work, we do a lot with cohort groups and lead them through, like we were hearing about in Sandoz, lead them through the process of their learning and development uh, so that those around them can continue to coach them as they migrate into the complex. Because, you know, as a, as a coach, the person may or not, may not be there in that moment, but if they have a coworker that can stop them and remind them of the one second, or just ask them to take a deep breath, um, it tends to help foster that. So it, part of it is taking some of those things that work in the complicated and just enabling an entire system, a moving, breathing, being, if you will, to execute on that in real life. 
For me, I think it's about the people, right? So it's about, I think, connecting to what you were saying, Betsy. It's about, it's about the colleagues you get to work with, and it's about the clients you get to work with. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I think the thing that enables us to be sometimes over in this complex space is to have clients who are willing to say, yeah, experiment, collaborate with us. We, we think of ourselves as on their team, you know? We, so we're not selling a product to them. That We don't know how to do that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, instead, the thing that we're doing is we're, um, we're in there together with our sleeves rolled up trying to figure out something that's never been figured out by anyone before. Mm. And when you have spectacular colleagues and spectacular clients, you can all nudge each other over into that complex space. I think for me, it's the starting point is now different. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was in this space, my starting point was, I know Myers-Briggs, I know this, I know this, and every one of my clients would get it, whether they want it, need it or not, <laughs> because I can charge this amount of money for that, and you know, now my starting point is, um, what does your business need of you, the leader, and what does your role need of you, and how are you addressing that? Because then automatically that brings the conversation into, wow, I actually don't know how I'm addressing that. And that's a different starting point. And Porig, what, what do you do when you, when you don't, that is a complete mystery. How, how, you know, start, you don't know. Start close in. <laughs> start, with, start with what do you know? When someone hired you and, and said, here's what we're hiring, what was that starting point? So let's start there. And then let's start with what's shifted in the organization since that starting point. And let's just try and map it out. And, and you know, from a physical perspective, mapping out something in, a, in writing or in butcher paper is where complexity starts to become simple. Because you know, you start to have frameworks. <laughs> But I always find what does the organization need of you is the best question to start unraveling where the complexity sits. Mm. Hello. Uh, and I wonder, just adding to that, Padraig, is um, for me it's about your creative, co-creative intention, that it's not coming with a fixed idea that I have the answer, um, that I am actually, it's the invitation into the experiment and the creating the space that allows the conditions for that experiment to thrive, I think, that um, I'd add to that. Mm. Well, th th that raises the fear. When you're asked to do three or four or five iterations of a proposal, what it really means is the client doesn't know what they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're just looking for a stitch on off a page and go, all right, no, it doesn't look right, let's go again. So and maybe proposal's not the... That's right, yeah, so co-creating right. it together is, is mm -hmm. where you start. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I see another one down here, Greg. What are, the, what are the questions that you ask to, for, le for, for leaders or clients to actually, you know, get that there is an, a, an investment that they need to make? Do you want those photographs to be made public? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the question that you ask in that, in that scenario. <laughs> Usually it's, it's what's at risk. You know, where is the risk for the organization? Where is the risk for the leader um, not uh, addressing or, or achieving what they're trying to achieve? Um, I mean, for, for that, for, for Alan, when he came into the organization, he, he chose to come into the organization very, very purposefully because he could see the potential. He could, he could also say, hey, look, if I can fix this, the potential is going to happen naturally, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So he, he was enlightened to the sense of there is an opportunity here both in the industry but also in this organization. I think what anybody is not enlightened to is how hard it is once you get into it. Um, and therefore, it's what's at risk of us not achieving this becomes a, a, a very commercial question. 
I mean, go back to the first question, for me, always when you're working with organizations, is it's back, what is your business strategy? Mm -hmm. And what's getting in your way of achieving that? And, you know, is that a human dimension? Because if it's a human dimension or complexity dimension, we can help you. And really, when you look at strategy, the biggest issue is not being enabled, not being executed. That, 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 and that's where we can play a part, is we can help the leadership team and execute their strategy. So what's at risk is, is, a, is a pretty important one, I think. I think mine is similar, which is, um if, if you're not, if you don't change, what's gonna happen? So, we often, we, we work mostly in industries that are changing so quickly that if, if our clients do nothing, high performing clients, if they do nothing, they're in massive trouble. Uh, and so, then, then I think the second question is, and are you ready to try? We say, we don't know how to make this thing happen. <laughs> Uh, but we have some ideas about how to get you farther in that direction. And, um, and if you have people who are wanting to think with us, try stuff out, um, play a little, then we know how to do that. I, I think my response goes a bit to Jennifer's earlier comment that we're no good at selling. Um, <laughs> because I, I, when you asked that question, I thought, I don't know that I've got those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I don't think I could give you um, a, a, a few kind of questions. And, I mean, I, I think there is probably something in the kind of adaptive challenge kind of space about who who needs to change and how might they need to change, in a, a kind of conversation about how people might need to change. But I really, I really don't... I, I think it is very contextual and very situational as to, I mean, I think the risk question is good. What's at risk? What's at risk? But maybe you think I've got a set of questions and I just can't remember them. It's got a set of questions, but not a good memory. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent <laughs> actually, questions. The, the other thing, the other thing, actually, my questions are usually pretty hopeless, but I've got, I've got a great line on solutions. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that, that, that we certainly do is, um, and, and it's more a conversation rather than just a series of questions, and, and is to you know, paint a picture that, um, that this is a journey as distinct from a series of episodic events. And that, you know, is there, a, is there an appetite? How much appetite is there in the system to invest in a longer term journey and by the way that you know that the invitation is that at any point in time along the way if you feel that it's not working then let's sit down and have the conversation early and vice versa we would like to have that same um, invitation to sit down and to point out and to notice what we notice so that it becomes a, a partnership as distinct from a vendor who, as you know, that you, we, we, oh, we've got it, we've heard that you've got a series of 360s and culture surveys and wonderful interventions and whatever, send us a proposal. And by the way, it's not, ch it's, it's, it's not as cheap as the other one, so we'll go with the other one. It's much more around having a conversation. And often, for us, it's like, well, if the conversation, if, if, if the individual or the client or the leadership team are not willing to have that conversation, then the question becomes, are we the right, mm. are we the right people to partner you on this journey? Right. Because one thing's for clear, clear for us is that, that you know that we we would prefer not to be treated as a as, as a slot machine that you just can put money in and point and press the buttons and you get something out. For us, it's a much much deeper conversation. Mm. Um, and in the, embedded in that, then the, the questions emerge. Both ways, yeah. through the deep listening and the, and the engagement. Revel, I saw your hand. You want to stand up just for a sec? Thanks. I think, um, Roma, I want to add just one thing to your question. You know, I think that for me, the questions, whether I'm talking to a client, uh, one of my children, or a friend who's trying to do something, I'm always interested in finding out what are they trying to do, um, how are they showing up, and how is that working for them. 
And I think that might just be lens I see through that then starts a bigger conversation as I listen to the Sandoz case. They, they go through that, you know, how were they showing up? Uh, and then how was that working for them? And I think they were getting business results that they wanted to shift a bit. Thank you. Uh, I was just gonna add, there's a fantastic quote from Otto Sharma where he talks about the success of an intervention depends on the interior conditions of the intervener. Mm -hmm. And often, uh, so particular, obviously in the space of um, the contemplative practices, having a conversation about the reality of the internal space mm -hmm. um, can open up dialogue, mm -hmm. I think. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> I've only got 15 minutes to answer that question. Um, I think about that question every single day. Um, and what could I say that's useful in just a tiny amount of time? Uh, I think we don't know what's next. I totally agree with you that the structures of organizations are um, limiting who we can become. And I think the thing that I've found is most ironic is that those organizations that have the strongest cultures, like the way we do things around here, and sometimes those cultures have been created in unhelpful ways, but many times those cultures have been created in fabulous ways mm -hmm. to get a kind of a sense of us. And those cultures seem to me to be the ones that very often have a ceiling effect and lid the development of their people. And that happens through hierarchy and it happens through um, raised eyebrows, you know, like, really? You're gonna ask that question? Um, it, and so I think that the reinventing organization idea, the self-organization, the devolving power to folks um, is one really interesting way to go. Snowden doesn't like that way at all. Um, it, I'm just, had the chance to read Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy's new book. It'll be out next year. And, um, and that doesn't have any of those characteristics. Um, in, the developmentally, in the deliberately developmental organization, it seems to be about really providing feedback. I mean, here we are at a leadership circle, 360, which is about feedback. The, the thing that seems to be in their research the most developmental is to be constantly seeing a picture of yourself. And you can do that in an organization that looks quite conventional in some ways. So I don't know, I don't know. I live in confusion about this, but I think it's a very interesting set of questions. And I think we are helping clients invent what happens next. Can, can I just add to that? Because you didn't use all your 15 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, the the um, I'm, I'm deeply torn on this in many ways, um, and uh, very attracted to aspects of these, this new, these new possibilities for organisations, often very sceptical about aspects of them as well, very afraid of some of the things that traditional hierarchical organisations do quite well to keep us safe, and, and afraid about the consequences, so I, I feel personally very torn about it. And, and I think I am in the midst of multiple polarities, you know, on this. And I think it would, it really, I think at a, at a point like this, it helps us, it helps me, to be aware of the kind of multiple polarities that tug us in different directions in the sense of what we, what we are looking to gain and what we might lose in going in these different directions. And Jennifer and I and our, and Jim here, as in, and the other, number of six or so other um, associates of cultivating leadership in the room here, we are trying to use some of those ideas of La Luz um, in reinventing organizations to look at how we construct uh, a global network that is 
self-organizing and distributed. And um, developmental. And developmental. And um, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but, a, but, a, but a beautiful challenge to have. Hard play. Hard play. I have a very clear answer. I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> and I, but I'm clear on that. <laughs> and on the other thing, that's helpful. Because uh, I've been in, in many conversations where people are trying to figure out what is the structure we need to get to, i.e., we want certainty. Mm -hmm. um, and literally two weeks ago, I was sat in a conversation with the global HR team with 10, I think it was 10 HR directors from around the world for an organization um, trying to answer the same question. How do we get the organization ready for the future? And this organization historically has taken a very decentralized view uh, of, of its structure and it's acquired businesses all over the world and now it's got 16 different businesses and it's going, oh, maybe we need to become centralized. I have the other priority. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a lot, so it's asking that question. And what they realize, to, well, where they've got to so far is, we don't know the answer to this, so let's try and stop answering that question. Let's look at how do we make sure we're getting the next level of leadership ready to take over the organization as a whole so therefore they can answer that question. <laughs> Because you know the question will shift anyway, right? So, uh, so a different focus. So they're very clear on what they don't know. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. What is your intention in going into work in organisations? Yeah. Got a big calling on that one. Um, Got nine oh. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, my deep concern is the autopilot that we act on causes us to be unconscious about the decisions we're making on a day to day basis. And I don't know that mindfulness is the whole answer to that. In fact, I know mindfulness isn't the whole answer to that but I'm bloody committed to turning up and being in the conversation that surfaces that and helps make a difference to that. That's, what, that's my intention with this work. Um, well, for me, I have a little bit of a different role. Um, I can tell you uh, when I do client work or when I'm working with our global practitioners or our global team at the Leadership Circle, um, I wake up every day and get to work with a team that is focused on serving whoever it is they're touching, whether that is a community member or a practitioner or a company that we're working with, serve them in the way of where they are now and try and help them advance to the next place that we're intended to get them to. And we find when we come from that place, our solutions are better, our, um, we have a better time, <laughs> we have fun with one another. Um, and often we get the business results that we're looking for, but we come from this place of servitude and support for just helping them move along in their journey. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's um, my role in, in our own business, but also as a parent and also as, as working with our clients, is I try every day to help them be as effective as they can be in their role and some days, hopefully, brilliant. <laughs> and and that's, that's what navigates me. And for me, is hopefully, I can be effective most days, and some days, hopefully, brilliant. For me, I have the sense that um, each of us lives in sort of a band. And sometimes we're at our biggest selves, and sometimes we're at our smallest selves. And that organizations very often, because of the way they're organized and because of the way work happens, Organizations very often have us in our smaller selves as we walk in the door. And, um, and, and I think that that's not just bad for us as individuals, I think it's bad for our planet. Mm. I think it's not a good idea to have our organizations, which are so important um, to our environment and to our collective future, um, or our governments, or our nonprofits, whatever, we work across all sectors. And, um, and so I try to help my clients create organizations that welcome people's bigness uh, and help them bring their, their biggest selves. Because I just have a sense that if we could do that, uh, that would be, not only would it feel better, mm -hmm. but it would actually be better for the world if we could have organizations where we could all be stretching into our potential. 
Um, you, you probably need to know that I'm a kind of died in the world do-gooder. Um, <laughs> and so I have a kind of history of being um, an environmental activist and a, a work with Oxfam and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of driven to, um, and, and as a, in the non-government sector and then in the public sector as a kind of leader to try and change the world for the better. And um, this work is for me about enabling organisations as places of learning um, to make the world a better place. Uh, and so it's, I'm not saying that it's, it's the firm's design, but that, that's what, what kind of drives me. That's my intention. How can I help? Thank you. So we have room for probably one more question. Yes, thank you. Can I get you to stand, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tim. Yeah, there would be clients I would say no to, and there are clients I'd say no to, and 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 that line moves. You know? mm -hmm. um, uh, I was once in, in, in charge for for the government department in New Zealand, manage, it's the equivalent of National Parks Parks National, no, New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service. And, and, and I was in charge of the sponsorship policy. And, and, and anyone who wants to sponsor an environmental government department has got something in their past that they don't want to, you know, others to kind of, they're, they're trying to clean up their, their past. I mean, that, 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 that's the nature of the, of the exchange. Um, and, and so you had to kind of construct a policy that said, yeah, sure. It, it, uh, there's, a, there's a famous quote of uh, Major Booth's of the Salvation Army about tainted money. And he thinks, says, the problem with tainted money is they taint enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you've got to try and construct a way that says, yeah, you know, money has all of that kind of taint to it, but, and some of it is worse than others, and so where do I put a kind of line? And I think it moves around. But it, and, and for me at the moment, it moves around partly in terms of how much can we push the edges, how much can we learn, how much can we experiment, how much is this client wanting to come on a journey with us? But for me personally, there'd be some clients I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with. That's just a personal decision. Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> um, and for me, it's about how much are people willing to change and how closely are our values aligned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been in organizations where it looked to me from the beginning, from like the first meeting, I thought, yeah, we're totally not going to be aligned. And then after a conversation, I think, I was so wrong about what you were on about, and um, I can help. And it's actually worked the other way, too. I've been in organizations where I think our values are so aligned, and then they treat their people so badly. <laughs> and they don't care about treating their people so badly. And they want to treat them badly harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it's easy for me to walk away from those, too. For me, there's multiple layers to that question. We only have two minutes, but there's, there's you know, where in the market are you positioned? You know, for our business, we are with new CEOs, leadership teams, expat leaders. So we have a, there's a positioning piece. There's a, it's a financial piece. You know, to what degree willing people willing to pay the, the levels you want to you want to ask for, and then there's there's a piece around. So once you get past those, we're, we're now talking to some clients who, of course, are all lining outside the door. So on a Monday morning, you get to go and check them all out and go, <laughs> right, of that long line, let's just see which of you are gonna. Right? That's, you want just, the same situation? Just take yeah. the odd numbers. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> on a Monday, we only work with brown-haired people, right? That, right. But, yeah, but once you have that line outside your door that you are, you are checking, there, there is a value check. There has to be yeah. a value check. And for us, it's about the leader of the leadership team. Are they willing to, to learn and change? Mm -hmm. And they don't know what that means up front, mm -hmm. but is there a willingness to at least have a go at this? That, that's a key piece. I um, felt myself as you asked that question, that polarity around tension and safety, or purpose and safety that Roman mm -hmm. talked about earlier. And um, for 
for us, it, obviously within the mindfulness niche, there's um, there's lots of well-being programs that that are that are enabled to make people work harder and faster mm -hmm. and just be more resilient while they while they slowly drop off the. Oh, they burn out. And and <laughs> actually, that's not okay. That's so. For us, it's around organisations that are looking at systemic change mm. through the intervention of, a, of that sort of practice mm. that um, really float our boat. But sometimes there's those safety customers as well. Yeah. Mm. I think everything that they said was just right on. <laughs> and uh, I mean, honestly, it's, it's all about the situation and, and where you're at and um, kind of different sca stage gates in between. Um, and that is saying to me, time up. Can I also <laughs> say, the clients have to be fun. Like for me, I have a fun thing, and so I have to really like them. <laughs> so there's the values, and there, you know, there's like principles, and, but that I have to like them. <laughs> there has to be some kind of a resonance. Yeah. Thank you. Please, uh, please uh, join me in thanking the, the panel today.